Okay, I'm very pleased to be here today. My name is Oscar Nierstras. I've been working with Fink for a year and a half or so. I've been working with Glamorous Toolkit for a few years. Uh, we've had uh, some experience over the years in uh, teaching people about moldable development. Glamorous Toolkit is, uh, can be thought of as a new kind of a development environment, but what the real point is, is that it encourages you to it's designed so that when you build your applications, you can uh, uh, very easily and cheaply build custom tools to make your applications explainable. Uh, however, in order to do that, uh, you have to change the way in which you think about software development. So what I'm gonna show to you today are some of the patterns that we discovered how uh, best to do that. But before I do that, let me first explain a little bit better what moldable development is. So the whole idea about moldable development is that when you develop a piece of software, it's not just a question of having the software be uh, uh, to fulfill its goals, but you also want to be able to understand and uh, explore the software systems. So uh, what we'd like to do is to make a software system explainable. What this means is that we want to take the domain concepts in the application, make them visible, and, uh, and uh, associate different views with them, which will help answer questions about the software. To make this a little bit clearer, let's take an example of a particular application domain. You can take any at all, but in order to keep things simple, let's take one which everybody should be familiar with, namely the ESUG website. So what we see here is an explorer for the ESUG website. It's showing us lots of things here. So here we see an overview. We see that we've got 319 pages, certain number of links, external links, internal links, and so on. And we can dive into these. For example, we can see the individual pages. We can see that there's a page called Companies, which has 100 links. Uh, and uh, let's see, here's the index page. It's got uh, 23 links. We can dive into it. We can see more information about that. And we can see, for example, that there are a certain number of reachable pages reachable from this page. Uh, we can look at the contents of the page. We can go to the page itself. And uh, we can, for example, see a map of the pages that are reachable from this particular root page, which is here, the one in orange. Uh, dive into the ones that we can see. The other blue pages are navigation uh, links in the navigation menu. The other green pages are the ones that we can actually reach and we can dive into any particular one of those. Also from the overview of the whole website, we can uh, ask ourselves questions like, well, of the links that are there, which are the links that are missing? So these seem to be pages that are referred to from other pages, but uh, we can't find them in the website. So this, for example, page here doesn't exist at all. Um, we might also ask questions about the HTTP links that are, uh, that are in the system. And uh, some of these, we have a status associated with them, but of course we actually have to ping the remote sites to see what's going on. So we can start that uh, little process here, which is starting to look at the HTTP links. And then we can see here uh, which ones are okay and which ones have timed out for various reasons or have other problems. Here's one that looks a little bit odd, has a name lookup failure. Let's go and see if that really is the case. And in fact, the server can't be found. So there's some links here which seem to be broken. Uh, and this is a way of getting an overview. Uh, let's stop that and um, look at, we can see all the reachable pages of the system. If we look at the reachable pages here, we can dive into them and see uh, a map of all of the reachable pages in the uh, website. That takes a little while to generate. But we could also ask for a map of the website as a whole. And uh, that takes a little bit longer to render, but uh, once we have it, we can see that the map on the right-hand side is a subset of the uh, map of the overall system. And there we have it. And all the red dots seem to be pages which are inaccessible. Uh, uh, so the pages that exist, like this one here, uh, what is it? I have to zoom in to be able to 
access it. Uh, a little bit hard to click because it's so small. You can see what this is. And it's a page that exists, but for some reason uh, doesn't seem to be accessible. But it looks like it's a rather old page, so probably these things are, are, are not real issues. Okay, why am I showing you this? What we've done here, um, we have the, the website of ESUG, and it's a piece of software. And it's sitting in a Git repository, and if we clone that repo, we see a lot of stuff. But if we start asking questions about it, it's not so easy to answer those questions. So the whole idea of moldable development is to take your piece of software and turn it into something that answers questions to you. So I had a whole bunch of questions here about the ESUG website, and it could start answering these questions by molding the environment by adding new custom behavior. So for example here, we have a bunch of views. So this view here, the overview, is defined in just this little method here. Uh, so GT overview for, and it's just defined with a, a few lines of code and an annotation, GT view. We have other things like, for example, we have, um, <clears throat> uh, we have custom actions. So this was the action which started uh, running the uh, status check. It's also a few lines of code, and it's defined with a GT action um, annotation. There's something I haven't shown you yet. So for example, suppose I wanted to, I'm interested in just knowing about the pages referring to uh, 2023, I can pose a query here. And uh, this will give me a list of all of those pages, and I can get a map here of just the pages related to 2023. And interestingly, it seems there's a whole bunch of pages that are not accessible. That could be an error in the custom tools I've developed, or it may be that actually the pages are there, but there's no easy way to get to them from the ESA homepage. We don't know yet, but it's something worth exploring. So we have custom views, we have custom actions, and custom searches. Custom searches are just like uh, the other kind of moldable tools. They're also defined in just a method with a, a little annotation. In this case, it's GT search. So we've seen here, um, we've seen here three kinds of different ways that you can mold the environment. Uh, and now the question might arise: Well, how do we actually learn how to make uh, uh, a system explainable by molding the environment? What are the tricks, or actually, what are the patterns? We've observed quite a few of these over the years, and based on our own experience, and also from experience um, mentoring and onboarding uh, newcomers, uh, we've identified a bunch of these which are quite interesting. I'm just gonna show a few of these patterns to you uh, using the examples from the ESUG website. So multiple development patterns are best practice patterns in the process of molding software to make it explainable. You can think of them as process patterns, or you can also think of them as design patterns. In fact, uh, as I'm presenting them today, they look more like uh, design patterns because they're nouns rather than verbs. Let's start with the first one. So the first one uh, we call moldable object. And I would call this the most fundamental of the patterns. It looks very simple, but in fact is uh, uh, difficult to really learn. Why is this the case? So first of all, what's the idea of moldable object? Moldable object uh, says that if you want to mold your application and make it explainable, instead of starting from uh, a coder view, you should start from an inspector on the object itself. Now why is this bizarre? So here is the classical coder view that you have of uh, a piece of software. You see all the methods, you see the class definition, uh, all of the stuff that we're used to. We can go up in the hierarchy and see uh, super classes and see their code. We can query the code uh, and find other, uh, other methods. This is the view that we're used to. Why? Because when we start programming, what are you usually confronted with? If you remember your first experience programming, you probably were put inside uh, some development environment or at the very least some kind of a text editor where you could edit code. And then once you finished writing some code, you could run it, either in a REPL or you could compile it and then run it. But 
your starting view of the code was a text editor. The problem with that is that that's completely static. You have no live object there. In order to get to a live object, you have to do some programming first and then run something. And then finally, uh, if your code luckily works, then you might eventually get some object and see what happens. However, then if you want to uh, modify its behavior, you go back to the text editor and you repeat this cycle. So this is rather painful. So what we propose instead is what you should start with is always start with a moldable object. So here we have the ESA website object, and we can actually code with it. We can open up a playground and start writing code there, or we can uh, navigate to the meta view, which is showing us the code view of that, uh, the class of that object or its parents, or we could just navigate to the standard coder view. This is one of the most fundamental patterns. So once you have a live object, you have something that you can see, you can see the, uh, the effect of the new code that you're writing immediately on that live object. This completely reverses the way that you classically uh, program. Now, if you're small talk, uh, experienced small talk programmers, everybody knows that you can program in the debugger. However, to program in the debugger, you have to set a breakpoint somewhere and you have to wait for an exception to be raised to get a debugger, and then you get an, a, a stack view, which may or may not be interesting, and you get finally an inspector on a live object, and then you can code there. But you have to get this breakpoint, you have to get this exception. What we'd say instead in GT, we've really made the inspector the center of development. So if you start with a live object, then you have an inspector on an object without necessarily having, uh, having got there through the debugger. Okay, so this is one of the uh, most fundamental patterns and it's probably the most difficult to learn. I caught myself numerous times going to the coder when I should have started with an inspector. And now you may ask, well, uh, how do you do that? Well, if you are doing a greenfield implementation, you just create the class and create an instance of an empty object. So you have an empty object and then you can start inspecting it even though there's no behavior and slowly adding stuff. But you can do the same thing if, for example, you're working with data. So in the case of the ESUG website, uh, the first thing we're going to do is we grab the data. So here we have the repo cloned. I had it already cloned. And I can inspect the file view of the object. Well, this is OK, but I can't mold a file locator object. So what's the trick? In order to be able to mold this data, I have to wrap it. So the idea of a data wrapper is, is an easy one. There's nothing remarkable about that. What's fundamental and really interesting is when you use that data wrapper as a center, the starting point of your moldable development. So once we've done that here, now I've wrapped this, and my basic inspector view that I get is what you expect from any inspector in any IDE. It has this very boring and ugly raw view where you can uh, navigate through the, uh, uh, the hierarchy of the slots of the object. Um, however, now once you have this, you can start exploring the object, you can start interacting with it and adding views. And after some iterations of that, you will get something that looks like what I showed you earlier. So we started with uh, a simple wrapper and slowly, step by step, added all of these views that are answering questions that we have about the data. So the process is you wrap the data, you start asking questions, uh, you start writing some code to navigate to answer those questions, and you lift that code up, turn them into custom tools that answer those questions. And that's how you, you grow your uh, moldable object. Next pattern I'd like to show you very quickly is a contextual playground. So once we have uh, a wrapper, uh, around an object, we can start interacting with that object. Here, for example, we say, okay, well, this repository, the stuff that's in the repository directory, the things that we're actually interested in are just the pillar pages, because the pillar pages are the ones, the pillar files are the ones that contain the content for the pages of the website. So we can extract those, and then we can do things like, uh, make sure I grab everything here, I could then, for example, do something like extract method and say, okay, what, these are the pages that I want. In this particular case, 
uh, pages is already defined, but I'll add it to the class here. And now we have lifted this up. So now self pages is going to give us the, uh, uh, the answer to the question, what are the pillar pages of this repository? Notice what's key here is you have a contextual playground. This playground has access, is bound to the environment of the moldable object itself. That means that all of the instance variables, all of the methods are available here. So this is as if we were coding in the text editor of the IDE, except the difference is that it's live. All of the names that you're using are bound to the environment of that object. And you can actually use them and experiment with them. So you can try out the code, see if it works rather than in the other approach where you're sitting inside a text editor, you write code and you don't know if it works until you've, you've completed it. Here you can work with little fragments, test them out, grow the code, and then turn it into a behavior that's useful to you. A related pattern, closely related pattern is viewable entity. Once you start exploring with an object, so here for example, we see self pages of C, Oh, heck, if I navigate to pages, I get this nice uh, array view, which is showing me all of the, um, the list of all of the, the files which correspond to pages. I'd actually like to have that view not here on the right-hand side, but be it part of the view of my uh, ESUG website uh, wrapper. So this is quite easy to do. I will copy this code that I have here already. Uh, all I have to do is I can uh, browse the class or go to the meta view, either way is fine. And then I can add a new method, which is this code. So what does this code do? It defines a new view, we saw one earlier, it has the GT view annotation. And since there's a view that exists already, namely the view that we just saw, uh, let's go back and see that again. So here's the array view and I can uh, option click on this and see it's defined by a method called GT items for. And this is an existing view, so rather than writing, I could copy paste that code, but the easiest thing I can do for starters is I can just say, uh, let's forward to this existing view of self pages, that's the array, and the view that I want is the GT items for view. Now the cool thing is if I store this, bang, that view is already there. So I get immediate response and I've molded the, the environment uh, to give me more useful information about, um, about my object here. Then later, if I want to adapt this, I can take this very simple view and turn it into something more sophisticated like a column list and add additional columns with more information as we saw before. Okay, I've just shown you five patterns. There's a whole bunch of others which are described in the GT book. If you go to, uh, if you download G Toolkit and go to the GT book, it's a collection of uh, pages, notebook pages, with uh, documentation about all parts of the system. You'll find a, a particular page on the moldable development patterns and a list of descriptions in more detail of things like moldable object with uh, descriptions of the forces, the solutions, the steps, all of the trade-offs, and so on. So we have these patterns. What else works to help teach people about moldable development in our experience? Get this annoying stuff out of the way here. So these are the uh, background checks that I started and stopped earlier. So one thing that's very useful is that's curious, that happened before too, uh, is live documentation. So GT comes with uh, a database of notebook pages, uh, which are on the one hand documentation in Markdown, but they're also interspersed with code snippets and live executable examples. So here we have documentation, for example, of case studies with uh, live code inside them. Uh, so you have a combination of uh, documentation and actual things that you can try out. And these pages are all linked, so you have uh, essentially a kind of a wiki of uh, notebook pages. This, uh, we've invested quite a lot of effort into building up this documentation. Uh, as uh, Tudor likes to say, it's the size of a Harry Potter book now. 
so this is very useful for the community and uh, no surprise to the Ferro community, Discord is an extremely useful tool. However, in order to really foster the community, you have to be sure, have to make sure that when people come questions, you're able to come quickly and uh, support people. So that means answering questions quickly and fostering uh, a sense in the community of people willing to help other people. So this is extremely important, so that people aren't afraid to ask questions and people will jump in to answer them. Uh, another thing that's very important is to help is to try and mentor people and uh, work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Obviously, that doesn't scale to a large community, but once you've established that as kind of a pattern, then you'll find that uh, other newcomers very quickly become ex experts in their little corner and are able to help and mentor other people as well. One thing that does scale much better is, uh, in addition to the documentation, is live video, is uh, videos. Uh, we have a uh, number of rather longer videos of uh, interactive sessions with people. I'm not a fan of videos. My wife likes to watch uh, YouTube videos of recipes. I hate that and I want the transcripts so I can read the recipe. So I'm a much more of a fan of very short videos. So one of the projects that I started was to have a series of uh, short seven minute videos on specific topics. Uh, one thing that I learned, however, is making a short video is uh, often more work than making a long one uh, because it takes a lot more planning and, uh, uh, and effort in, in making it truly effective. Before I close, uh, I want to talk briefly about a couple of the challenges. Uh, I think the first one is uh, people hate change. I mentioned already the moldable object pattern. People are very used to, when they start to code, to open up a text editor. So we're used to having a view like this, where we can write our methods and, and see the, the static source code. And switching to a place where you have a live object and code in a playground, extract methods, and, uh, and slowly grow a live object is not the way we usually think about programming. So that's a challenge. And you have to show people over and over again how that works before, uh, in our experience, before they get it and they start to feel comfortable in, in uh, working that way. And another thing that we've noticed is that if we try and show people uh, the tools, they very often latch onto the first thing that they see and they say, oh, okay, that's it. So if they happen to see live interactive visualizations, they say, okay, this is a, uh, to, it's all about visualization. If they see the language workbenches first, oh, it's all about uh, parsing and developing, uh, uh, developing parsing and refactoring tools. Or if they see the Lepidor notebooks, they say, oh, it's all about documentation. It's like Jupyter notebooks, but a slight variation. Uh, and if they see the live windowing systems, they say, oh, it's just a new kind of graphical uh, interface to, to Faro and Spalltalk. Uh, but the thing is, it's not any one of those things. It's all of these ingredients are needed together to support the idea that you can have an environment which can be molded and adapted over time. So that also takes some effort to convince people that it's not just any one of these things, but it's a whole combination of them uh, together. So, to wrap up, uh, we think moldable development is something that can be learned. It requires some effort, and one of the things that we think is probably a best way of starting to teach people is to focus on the moldable development patterns. We've seen four or five of them today. Uh, there's a bunch of others here in italics, which are draft versions in the book. I welcome you to have a look at them. Things like a project diary, example object, and so on. There are also patterns which are very important, but uh, I would say that the, the four or five that I showed you today are perhaps the most fundamental ones. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm, that wraps up my presentation for today and really um, encourage you to try this stuff out. You can just directly download gtoolkit from gtoolkit.com and all of this stuff there is there for you to try. Also, if you want to look at the exploration of the ESUG website, that's in there too. You can just search for ESUG and you'll find it in moments.
Thanks for your attention.